Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our Wednesday webinar program live from Washington, D.C. We are uncovering each part of the DFARS or the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you know, the DFARS are the rule books for co contracting with the Defense Department. We have been moving sequentially, so we started with DFARS Part 201 in January, and we will be finishing with Part 253 in December. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They are recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 450 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions. So if you have any questions for our speaker, we'll have his information on the last slide of the presentation today. And thank you to all of our sponsors. Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTACs can offer. Set Aside Alert provides up-to-date news, information, and opportunities for small business federal contractors. Their daily opportunities alerts assure you won't miss important sources, saw, and solicitation announcements, providing details so you can jump on the hot ones. Every two weeks, they deliver concise breaking news, events, regulations, and teaming opportunities. Please join the Reston Chamber of Commerce Government Contractors Council for regular meetings. Please contact Alicia Field with the email shown on the screen if you have any questions. C3 Integrated Solutions, a full-service IT provider that specializes in securing our nation's defense industrial base through cloud-based solutions and industry-leading partners. For more than 13 years, C3 has provided boutique tech services, including managed services, security, and Microsoft 365 integration services. C3 specializes in Microsoft government cloud solutions, including GCC, GCC High, and Azure Gov helping clients achieve CMMC, DFARS, and NIST 800-171 compliance. C3 offers an award-winning tailored approach to each client, regardless of size and across a variety of industries. WorkPlan is the only ERP system built for government contractors that's both easy to use and robust. WorkPlan is affordable and scalable to contractors of all sizes. The system includes everything needed for DCAA compliant accounting, time and expense, incurred cost submission, project budgeting, and forecasting, and more. To see how WorkPlan can work for you, visit the links provided. Okay, and now a little bit about us. We work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More, informa more information is available on our website. We have launched another webinar series called the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. This is a live webinar series held each month. These will take place on the second Friday of each month in 2021 at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. The panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen and then take your live questions about that topic. Our panelists include attorneys, consultants, and other industry professionals. You can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab. Sponsorships are available. Please note that you can use code DFARS for a $15 discount on each webinar. Next month, we are covering pricing with Michael, Marsha, Tracy, and Jeff. And in December, our speakers, Shirley, Joshua, Kate, and Brad, will present on M&A. Again, the discount code is DFARS to save $15 and bring your cost to $20. Okay, now to introduce our speakers, Mark. Welcome, Mark. We're so glad to have you here with us today, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Great. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, so again, uh, I'm Mark Amadeo, uh, and I'm the principal of the Amadeo Law Firm. Uh, and I have over 20 years uh, of experience, both as a government attorney uh, and in private practice. Uh, and a little bit about the firm. Uh, it has locations in D.C. and in Maryland, and its primary focus is on federal government contracting uh, and we help our clients with all of their uh, government contracting legal needs so my contact information is up there uh, on the slide and we'll provide it uh, at the end of the presentation uh, so if you have any questions on the information that i'm presenting today feel free to reach out to me uh, after the presentation <laughs> 
Next slide, please. And next slide. Okay. So today we're talking briefly uh, about DFARS Part 245, uh, which covers the rules under the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement on Government Property. Now, as we know, DFARS is intended uh, to supplement the Federal Acquisition Regulation, uh, and it applies to government contracts between uh, government contractors uh, and defense agencies. But often, uh, the regulations in DFARS are, in fact, a wholesale replacement of the rules in the FAR. So, for example, if you look at the DFARS regulations and clauses on um, uh, data and patent rights, uh, those regulations and clauses largely act uh, as a parallel set of rules that apply uh, in lieu of the FAR uh, rules and clauses. But that's not the case uh, with DFARS Part 245. Uh, if you look at DFARS Part 245 in its entirety, uh, you will see that, in fact, there are really only a handful or so of the FAR regulations that are changed or supplemented to any significant degree by DFARS. So for defense contractors, uh, part, FAR Part 245 will remain, will remain uh, the main source for the basic rules uh, that cover government property. Uh, and if their contracts anticipate uh, that the contractors will acquire government property, uh, they will more likely than not uh, include uh, one of the FAR clauses that are listed up there on the slide, uh, including FAR clause uh, 52.2451, uh, which incorporates many, if not most, of the rules uh, on government property that are found in FAR Part 45. Now, since the scope of this webinar uh, and this webinar series uh, is on DFARS, we are going to go into all of the FAR regulations uh, on government property. And instead, uh, we're going to touch on the FAR regulations mainly uh, for some basic concepts, uh, but also to the extent that there may be some overlap with DFARS uh, and the DFAR regulations that address government property. Now, I've listed up there uh, on the slide all of the DFARS clauses uh, that are related to government property. And I'm, I've also listed uh, parts of the Procedures, Guidance, and Information, or PGI, uh, that discusses uh, government property. And the PGI is a companion resource uh, to DFARS uh, that DOD has developed uh, that it provides guidance to contracting officers uh, on how they are to apply the rules under FAR and DFARS. Next slide, please. So before we get into the DFARS rules on government property, we should quickly touch on uh, what it is that is considered government property. Now, as I've said before, uh, FAR provides the basic rules that apply to government contracting, including uh, defense con contracts, and it sets out the relevant definitions. So under FAR uh, 45.101, uh, government property means all property that's owned or leased by the government. And this includes both government furnished property and contractor acquired property. So for example, it can include material uh, or equipment or uh, special tooling and special test equipment and real property, but it doesn't include uh, intellectual property and software. Now under FAR and DFARS, there are two kinds of government property. There's government furnished property and there is contractor acquired property. Now, as for government furnished property, uh, FAR defines the term to mean property that's possessed or directly acquired by the government uh, that's subsequently provided to the contractor for contract performance. And contractor acquired property means property that's acquired or fabricated uh, or otherwise provided by the contractor for performing a contract and that the government has title to. Next slide, please. So in that last slide, uh, we saw that the definitions of government property and contractor acquired property uh, discuss property in terms of the government's ownership or the government's retaining title. Now, and the terms ownership and title under FAR uh, and DFARS are used interchangeably.
Now, FAR, FAR not only sets out uh, the controlling definitions, it also sets out the default rules uh, for when property becomes government property and for how long it stays government property. So when it comes to uh, government furnished property, again, we're talking about property uh, that the government already owns, uh, but it provides to the contractor for use under the uh, government contract. Well, for that property, FAR says uh, that it stays government property the whole time that the contractor uses it until the property is disposed of. And we'll talk a little bit about disposition uh, at the end of the presentation. Now, as for contractor acquired property, and again, this is property that the contractor acquires uh, or creates for contract performance. Uh, FAR says that a uh, title vests according to the terms of the contract, uh, but in the absence of contract language, the default rules are that for a fixed price contract, uh, the government acquires title to deliverables while the contractor retains title to everything else that it acquired. Uh, and for cost uh, and time and materials contracts, uh, the government acquires title to all property uh, that the contractor is going to be reimbursed for. And this kind of makes sense because uh, if the government uh, is essentially paying the contractor specifically uh, for the cost of all materials that the contractor is using, whether it's ends up in a deliverable or not, uh, well, the government should uh, get to own and use those materials. Now, one last note here, and this is something uh, that may seem obvious, uh, but can be overlooked easily, and that is that it's possible that for a contractor, uh, uh, particularly one that's involved in fabricating uh, or manufacturing or doing R&D work, well, it's possible that leftover items uh, like raw materials or tested components that don't make it into the final deliverable uh, may be considered government-owned property under one type of contract, uh, but contractor-owned property under another type of contract. So contractors uh, need, to, need to be mindful uh, at the outset uh, of the property ownership rules that apply so that they don't uh, slip into non-compliance. Next slide, please. So now that we've gone over uh, some of the basic concepts and definitions, we'll move on to uh, some of the areas that DFARS provides supplemental guidance for. So we'll start with the uh, overarching policy or general expectations regarding government property. Now FAR says that there's an expectation uh, that contractors ordinarily should bring with them all the property that will be needed to, perf to perform under a government contract. Now, DFARS doesn't address this directly, uh, but it does instruct contracting officers to review PGI 245.10270, which does address the issue. Now, and specifically, it, reiterate, it reiterates uh, that contractors should either bring with them all the property that they'll need, or they should have the ability to obtain any property. But it goes even further, uh, and it states that to the extent a defense contractor uh, uses or will use government property, uh, then as a responsible contractor, it should have the means to provide effective stewardship over that property. So the guidance implicitly uh, instructs contracting officers uh, to consider the ability of a contractor to provide stewardship uh, as an element of contractor responsibility. Next slide, please. Now, uh, we said earlier that government first property uh, and contractor acquired property were defined as property that's used by the defense contractor to perform under a contract. And this connection between a government property uh, and the, the contract that it's used for is captured by the rules on accountability under FAR and DFARS. So starting with FAR, uh, the FAR rule on accountability at 45.106 uh, says that uh, government property can be transferred or allocated to another contract uh, if the receiving contract has firm requirements for that property. Uh, and any transfers have to be documented with contract modifications. Uh, and any property that is transferred uh, is deemed government first property under the receiving government contract. 
Now, DFARS doesn't address accountability directly, uh, but it again directs contracting officers uh, to the guidance in PGI 245.10270, which says that property uh, is accountable to one contract at a time, uh, and a government contract can expressly allow uh, for the later use of the property uh, in other contracts. Uh, and PGI 245.10371 uh, reiterates uh, that, tra that transfers are executed only through contract modifications uh, and are documented only through the standard form contract modification, uh, which is the SF-30 uh, form. Next slide, please. So again, if you look at DFARS uh, and the DFARS rules on government property uh, or the PGI guidance that DFARS refers to, you'll see that there are only a handful or so areas under FAR uh, that DFARS explores or expands uh, to any significant degree. And one of those areas is the decision-making process for making uh, government property available to the contractor. Now, a defense contractor can't decide on its own uh, when it uh, wants to use government property. Um, the government has to decide whether or if a contractor can use its property. So the DFARS regulation for furnishing property to a contractor uh, at 245.10370 uh, instructs contracting officers to look uh, at the PGI guidance uh, for when to furnish government property to contractors. And that guidance says, first, uh, the agency project manager uh, or the program manager uh, or the purchase requester, uh, request generator is the ultimate decision maker and has to provide the basis for its decision uh, to the contracting officer. Now, the contracting officer, in turn, has to review that information uh, and make sure that the requirements under FAR uh, 45.102 are met. Now, FAR 45.102B provides in, pretty, in a pretty perfunctory manner uh, the four requirements that a contracting officer has to make sure are satisfied uh, in order to provide government property to contractors. But the guidance under PGI uh, takes each of those four requirements uh, and it goes into detail about what contracting officers should consider uh, in order to determine if a requirement or, or an element, as it's called in PGI, uh, whether they've been met. Now, and this guidance should be helpful to defense contractors uh, that want to convince program managers or, or contracting officers during uh, pre-solicitation discussions or, or post-award negotiations uh, that they're going to need access to the property uh, in order to perform on, under the contract. So the first uh, requirement is that providing government property to the contractor must be uh, in the government's best interest. And there are seven factors uh, that contracting officers have to consider uh, that are listed up there on the slide. Now, um, economy means that providing uh, government property to the contractor uh, is the lowest cost or uh, lowest cost or price alternative. Um, standardization focuses on uh, how the government property is needed for precise replication. Uh, security means that the government property is needed for national security interests. Um, scarcity focuses on, focuses on how scarce the item or property is uh, and whether the government's property is the only source. Uh, industrial base uh, focuses on whether the property is needed uh, to ensure the future capability to, imply, uh, to obtain a supply item or a service. And contract type uh, focuses on whether providing the property uh, gives the government the ability to obtain a favorable contract type. Next slide, please. So the second requirement uh, is that the benefit of providing the property must significantly outweigh the administrative costs. Uh, and the costs here uh, has to include all costs, including cost of disposal and demilitarization and disposal. The third requirement is that providing the property must not add significantly to the government's risk. So there has to be some kind of uh, risk analysis that addresses whether or not 
the government's risk increases uh, by turning over its property to a contractor. So for example, one risk might be related to the likelihood that the property is uh, or could become defective uh, and somehow present a danger. But there could be other uh, real and significant risks and they all need to be considered and documented by the contracting officer. Now the fourth requirement uh, is that furnishing government property has to be critical uh, and significant to meeting uh, the acquisition plan objectives that might not otherwise be met. Next slide, please. So another area or issue that the FAR supplements uh, is, with, is with regard to the liability for property losses. Um, under FAR uh, 45.104, it's the government and not the contractor uh, that assumes uh, the risk for any loss of government property uh, under a cost reimbursement, uh, time and materials, uh, and labor contract, and fixed price contracts that are awarded uh, on the basis of certified cost or pricing data. So as long as the contractor uh, isn't doing something that it shouldn't with the property uh, and something happens to it uh, under one of the listed types of contracts, then the contractor isn't liable for the loss of that property. Well, the regulation under DFARS point, uh, 245.104, uh, it expands the list of contracts so that it includes all negotiated fixed price contracts. Uh, now, getting back to uh, FAR 45.104, a contracting officer can revoke the government's assumption of risk uh, if the contractor's property management practices are not compliant with the terms of the contract. Uh, and a contractor remains uh, responsible for government property that it provides to a contractor. And lastly, uh, it's the contracting officer that determines the extent of a contractor's liability and the form of the government's recovery uh, in the event that there's a loss that's assume not assumed by the government. Next slide, please. So we just mentioned that under FAR, uh, a property management system that doesn't comply with contract requirements uh, can cause a contractor to be exposed to liability for property losses. So this leads us to another area under FAR that is substantially supplemented uh, by DFARS, and that is uh, the rules on contractor property management systems. So the FAR regulation uh, on government property has a section for contractor property management systems. And it sets out in very general terms uh, and in four relatively short paragraphs, uh, the process for an agency's uh, review of the property management system and the corrective action process that contractors can pursue uh, when an agency determines that the system doesn't meet contract requirements. Now, when we're talking about whether or not a contractor's uh, property management system co complies with contract requirements, um, those contract requirements are going to be found in the FAR and DFARS clauses that are inserted into the contract. So the FAR clause uh, on government property that's typically inserted uh, into government contracts, and that's FAR clause 52.2451, uh, uh, it explains that a property management system should address 10 areas. And the DFARS regulation at 245.105 similarly explains uh, that a contracting officer has to determine uh, if a system um, is acceptable. And the regulation then points to DFARS, the DFARS clause at 252.245703, uh, which defines what an acceptable system is. And that definition in turn points back to the 10 areas uh, that are listed in FAR 52.241, uh, which, which are listed up there on the slide. Now, again, these are uh, general FAR requirements, uh, so we aren't going to get into them in this presentation, uh, but the list and the slides are, are going to be made available for future reference after the presentation. Next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, a minute ago that the FAR regulation on government property addresses uh, in very general terms uh, the process for an agency's review of the property management system and the corrective action process. Uh, 
Well, def the DFARS regulation uh, and the DFARS clause covering contractor property management systems uh, provides a much more detailed description uh, of the agency's review and the correction action pro and the corrective action process with very specific timelines and guide um, and deadlines. So, uh, under those procedures, uh, the property administrator reviews the contractor's property management system and submits its findings to the contracting officer. Uh, and if there are any deficiencies, the property administrator will identify them. The contracting officer uh, then makes a written determination uh, of whether or not the system is acceptable or whether uh, there is at least one significant deficiency. So the contractor then has 30 days uh, to respond to that initial determination. Uh, the contracting officer then reviews any response by the contractor uh, and makes a final determination on whether uh, the system is acceptable uh, or if there are any significant deficiencies that remain. Uh, if they do remain, uh, the contractor has to correct them uh, and then, or submit uh, an acceptable corrective action plan. Now, defense contractors need to keep in mind that uh, if their contracts include the DFARS clause on contractor business systems, uh, and that's at 252.242.7005, then the contracting officer will withhold payments uh, if there are deficiencies um, as required under the clause. Now, the PGI provides some additional guidance, uh, and it says that the contracting officer uh, will not only monitor any corrective MAC action plan, uh, it will also verify through an auditor uh, that the deficiencies have been corrected. Now, all of this uh, is to say that by proactively reviewing their property management systems, uh, contractors can save themselves a lot of time and energy uh, resources, and quite frankly, they can spare themselves uh, the distraction and anxiety that comes with noncompliance uh, and the possibility of withheld payments. Next slide, please. So the last area that we're going to talk briefly about uh, are the rules under DFARS uh, that apply to leftover and excess property. So FAR lays out a process uh, and general procedures uh, for what is to be done with property that's no longer needed under a contract or, or that's left over at the end of the contract. You know, and boiled down, there are really four options. Uh, the property can be put back into use, uh, it can be abandoned, uh, it can be destroyed, or it can be sold. Now, the FAR regulations uh, and the FAR clause on government property lay out the process in detail. But briefly uh, and generally, uh, a contractor lists the property and the condition of the property on the SF1428, uh, which is the inventory disposal schedule. Now, a contractor can then request that property be removed from the list uh, if the contractor wants to purchase it at cost or reuse it on another contract. Uh, any property that's still on the inventory schedule uh, is then screened for potential reutilization or, or reuse. And you can think of this screening process like an entry agency a Craigslist for federal government property. Um, during the first 20 days, uh, it's the contracting agency uh, that gets the first shot at retaining property or donating it to a nonprofit. Uh, then after that, other agencies uh, can request a transfer of the property on a first-come, first-served basis. Now, any property that hasn't found a home after 46 days uh, can be resold commercially uh, or to the public. Um, and if it has no commercial value, uh, it can be destroyed or abandoned uh, as long as uh, it doesn't require demilitarization uh, or doesn't pose a danger to public health or welfare. Next slide, please. Now, as for DFARS, uh, subpart 245.6 supplements uh, the FAR in three areas. Now, the first is with regard to uh, the review of the inventory disposal schedules. So under FAR, uh, as long as the SF-1428 is completed correctly, uh, 
uh, it's accepted. Uh, but under DFARS, uh, the, the plant clearance officer uh, takes a closer look uh, at the termination inventory on the schedule, first to see if the property may in fact still be useful uh, to complete the contract uh, or to see if it exceeds uh, what's required for contract completion uh, or whether it can then be allocated uh, to other government use uh, or for commercial work. Now, second, uh, the plant clearance officer will verify uh, that the actual inventory count matches what's listed on the schedule. Uh, and lastly, the, the plant clearance officer uh, verifies uh, the physical condition of the property to make sure that it matches uh, what the contractor has indicated on the schedule. Now, the second area uh, that's addressed by DFARS at 245.6023 is with regard to screening. Now, DFARS says that screening will occur uh, DOD-wide with priority uh, to the requiring agency. Uh, and although not mentioned uh, on the slide there, the rule also says that the plant clearance officer will, upon request, uh, arrange for inspection of the property uh, at the contractor's plant. Next slide, please. So lastly, uh, DFARS uh, supplements the rules on the sales of surplus property. So under FAR 45.6041, uh, surplus property is sold in accordance with the policies uh, and procedures under the federal management regulation. And that regulation provides uh, an array of options uh, for how surplus personal property can be sold. Uh, and it gives an agency a pretty wide latitude in selecting the method uh, for selling sell, uh, surplus property. Well, DFARS 245.6 provides a little more guidance uh, in how the method of the sale will be chosen. Uh, it says that the plant clearance officer uh, will determine the method of sale using a best value sales approach uh, that considers cost and risks and benefits. Now, a plant clearance officer can direct a contractor uh, to issue an informal invitation for bid uh, as long as that process can le leads to real competition uh, and um, uh, any sources have to be um, that are solicited have to be identified and recorded, uh, and any informal bids uh, have to be confirmed in writing. Now, the plant clearance officer will evaluate bids then to make sure that the sales price is fair and reasonable. Uh, it'll approve the award to the responsible bidder as long as the bidder is not ineligible. Uh, and the bidders, uh, and the bid is the most advantageous to the government. And then the plant clearance officer will notify the contractor uh, of any winning bidder within five days after receiving bids. Now, lastly, uh, a plant clearance officer uh, can ut utilize a non-competitive sales method, uh, and that's even if it leads to a sale that's less than the cost to the contractor. Uh, if the plant clearance officer determines uh, that this me the method is most expeditious for plant clearance uh, and that the government's interests are adequately protected. So the sale has to be uh, at a fair and reasonable price uh, and at a price that isn't less than what one would expect under a competitive sale. Well, I that next slide. Yeah, I think that that's all I have for today on DFARS part 245. Uh, thanks to everyone again for listening. Uh, and if you have any questions on the presentation, feel free to reach out to me. All right, thank you so much, Mark. That was a great presentation. And thanks for sharing your time with us today. And thanks for everyone who joined us as well. Um, again, if you have any questions, please take note of Mark's contact information on the screen. And the recording will be available on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. And please join us next week as we cover more part of the DFARS. Thanks, everyone.